So good morning, everyone. Uh, congratulations to those of you who were able to accomplish coffee this morning. Uh, for those of you who weren't able to manage coffee this morning, may you be first in line at lunch for the beverage lineup. Um, today, I'm going to be giving a presentation that I've given a couple of times. Um, the slides are already uploaded for you, and uh, this session is being recorded, and it's also uh, been recorded previously, should there be any kind of failure with the recording. So with that sort of in mind, I will be delightful and charming for the next 57 minutes, um, and I'm happy to do a Q&A as well, but if you found that there was another session that you were also interested in seeing, I will not in the slightest be offended if you sneak out and go to that other session, because I want you to be getting best value for your entire DrupalCon experience. So this um, presentation is, I, it's, I mean, it's a great title, but if I'm being perfectly honest, it's not really what this title for this presentation is called. Um, really, this presentation is called something to the effect of a primer on how I learned to be a more empathetic person in the workplace. And I don't have that sort of caveat on that slide. Um, but as we see throughout the presentation, this is, um, this is a skill that can be developed and it can be used or not used. And it wasn't a skill that I was comfortable using in the workplace uh, for various reasons. So the gist of what I'm going to say is going to kind of end up feeling a little bit touchy, touchy, feely, woo woo, but in the best possible way. Um, and a lot of it, the presentations that I've seen where, and especially around DevOps and user research, they talk about how important empathy is, but they don't go on to actually give you the how-to empathy. And so this presentation, I'm hoping, will give people a bit more, um, more either vocabulary to discuss with other people in terms of your coworkers and getting empathy to be a tool in your toolkit at work, or perhaps the actual steps that you need to use yourself to be a more empathetic person in the workplace while still maintaining really healthy boundaries. One of the things that um, Temple Grandin is um, a biology researcher, I think is the best way to describe her, also uh, with Asperger's, I think, is the right definition of um, her diagnosis, condition. Um, and what she has discovered, or what she will say about people, is that we have an incredible lack of empathy. And it is, again, a skill that needs to be practiced. So one of the things that I um, did a couple of years ago was a leadership training program. And I had always considered myself someone to be relatively empathetic, but also relatively self-aware and um, able to understand that just because I had seen a movie on the big screen about topic whatever, that suddenly didn't make me able to experience the conditions that were depicted in that movie in real life. And so I've been fairly cautious about saying, yes, I can put myself in someone else's shoes. Yes, I can experience something through someone else. And so I took this leadership program, and one of the things that was a, a key part of the leadership program was the skills assessment. And it showed us our, our preferences of where we liked or what skills we like to use in the workplace. And they were all thinking strategies. So there's 18 thinking strategies. I'll talk a lot about them later on. But one of the things that I <coughs> came to realize is that actually I was not quite as empathetic as I thought in the workplace. And when I say not quite as empathetic as I thought, for those of you who aren't able to um, perceive or see the graphic on the screen, I scored a zero for empathy. Um, and it's one of those binary question surveys where if you score high in something, you have to score low in something else. So given the choice of whatever the two things were, I would always choose the non-empathetic answer as what I would prefer to do in the workplace. And for me, some of those questions were just structured in a way that I felt I, I wasn't able to accomplish the task. So did I really, truly feel like I could perceive a problem from someone else's point of view? And I, I just didn't think I could because I didn't think that being who I am as a person in terms of my upbringing, my background, the color of my skin, my gender, all of those things, I couldn't pretend to be someone else with a great deal of accuracy. And so every time one of those empathy questions came up, I would just say, no, I'm, I just can't do that. Or at least I can't do it with the casual nature which you have suggested is possible in the workplace. 
So as a result of this course, I had to decide, is this a skill that I want to try and develop, or is this something that I'm comfortable just continuing to say, nope, I'm gonna leave that for outside the workplace where I actually have the capacity to be empathetic with my friends and my families and with people who are around me in a day-to-day -day situation. And this talk is sort of my, <laughs> my realization that it was a skill that I could bring into the workplace and that I could nurture and I could develop if I so choose. So the first thing I wanna kind of double check with you is, is the definition of empathy versus sympathy. Empathy is, as I have said many times already and will continue to say during this presentation, it is that ability to get yourself in someone else's situation. Later in the presentation, I'll talk about um, essentially empathy practitioners and user researchers and, and DevOps and people who, it's their job to get inside what the experience is as a user or as a person using software. So understand and share is different from having pity for someone. So when I'm talking about empathy in this, the first sort of like stage one or level one scenario, I'm kind of really talking about sympathy and that's that ability to safely leave yourself detached from someone else and say, oh, I'm sorry that this sucks for you and, and that sort of disengagement but acknowledgement that there's a problem. Uh, Donna's presentation, which is later in this week, Kata Krab, is she adds a third dimension to this and talks about compassion. So if this topic is of interest to you or you want to send your friends and coworkers to a similar uh, session, I think she does a nice job of going one step deeper in terms of looking at a framework. It's less of a how-to, but um, a nice follow-up to this one. So today we'll be talking about empathy from three different levels. And I sort of thinking of this as a non-gamer, apparently you level up and move from one thing to another. Um, so I like to think of this as being, you know, that, that first level, everyone should be able to accomplish this first level by the end of this presentation. The second level is choosing a framework. Um, and I'm going to speak about one specific framework, but you could, you could adopt any number of frameworks. And, and thinking about structuring an experience from a framework that has, whether it's pseudoscience or actual science background, of how people are going to perceive the world and interact with the world, but thinking about selecting a framework and using it and getting your team on board with that framework um, so that you have some common language. And then the third one is sort of the, the empathy practitioner or the, the, the level three difficulty. I don't expect everyone to be able to walk out of this presentation able to be an empathy practitioner in terms of a user researcher or an anthropologist or however you um, think or whatever roles you think of as being, that's their job to understand um, someone else's experience and then to make it smoother. But that's level three, that's, that's the height of what we can get to. So the first one, level one, is caring just enough. And um, this is, <laughs> This is sort of the, the point at which you, if you speak in human resources speak, you stop thinking of people as resources and you start thinking of them of people as actually people with stories and experiences and someone who didn't get any sleep last night because the baby was up, someone who didn't get any sleep last night because they were out drinking may have the same result at 9 a.m., but it is a different experience that they are coming from. Um, so this is, this is beginner level stuff. I think, and the, the ultimate um, sort of takeaway on this one is to stop compartmentalizing, and that was something that I tended to do at work, and say, work is work, I'm going to put my professional face on, and I'm going to expect professional behavior from my coworkers at all times, I'm going to have a very low tolerance for mm, behaviors that I feel are not appropriate to the workplace, and then five o'clock, or whenever that sort of bell goes off at the end of the day, we all get to let our hair down, we all get to be as inappropriate as we want to be, and, and inappropriate stays outside of work. And um, also work stays in work and doesn't sort of blend over. As members of an open source community, you are probably aware that the lines get kind of fuzzy, and so that compartmentalization can be incredibly difficult. And so starting to, to relate to the people who are in this room, who are your coworkers, who are your fellow contributors as people is um, something that I think we need to do more of. So the risks and rewards, I only have to say that three times in this presentation, 
the risks and rewards are pretty simple. It takes a little bit of time investment and ultimately the win on this is that you're going to improve team cohesion. So pretty straightforward stuff so far. So how do we do this? Again, this is a practical session in terms of how do we actually engage in empathy. And ultimately, all we need to do at this point is to collect stories from people. So you need to ask them questions and you need to listen to the answers. And when I say listen to the answers, I mean stop and listen to the answers. So the um, acronym may be something that you want to look up, STFU. I'm not actually going to say that as part of my presentation, but I encourage you to Google if, if you don't know what STFU stands for. Um, but the, the key here is the listening part of empathy. And one of the things that I find quite difficult is when I'm hearing someone's experience about something, my immediate tendency is to jump in with my own equivalent experience. And that's almost denying that person's story because it's, it's, it's changing the focus toward me. And all I'm trying to do is make connections. And certainly as, um, as a professional teacher, I am constantly thinking about how can I how can I make a bridge for this learner? How can I make that connection a little bit more obvious? But that's not, what, that's not what we do when we're practicing empathy. In empathy, we stop, we listen, we receive the information, and then we ask questions. And maybe, at some point, we'll start sort of clarifying or, you know, in, when this happened to me, I found this. Can you describe to me how this is different or how it's the same? But it's used as a point of clarification, not as a way to change the story into, or change the situation into something about yourself. And then the next part of empathy in this sort of um, practical sense of the word is to refer back to those stories. So a week later, a month later, a year later, say back to someone, you had told me this thing. How is it going? Is that, has it improved? Is it, has it, have you resolved the issue? Are you still enjoying your job as much as you were? Those, those connections um, allow the person to, to give you more information and to feel that they were important and to feel that they had something to share with you. But it also reminds you that a story is not an isolated incident. It's something that's going to continue for that particular person. So if you want to be able to place yourself in that person's shoes to be, ex to be able to experience their life, you have to remember that their life does go on and refer back to that story that they've told you about. Pretty simple stuff, I think. So next we move into level two, and this is sort of the framework section. You can swap out your own system. I don't really care which system you use. This is the one that I have the most familiarity with, and it, um, it, <sighs> my quote here is because I, I genuinely don't care which system you use, but I do really, really like this one. And the reason why I like it is it, it doesn't say I'm a bad person for not using empathy in the workplace. It says I'm really good at something else and I have to make a conscious decision to engage in some behaviors or thinking strategies is what they call them. So the re rewards and risks for this particular one is that we can engineer successful outcomes. Now, if I look down on the bottom section, you can see that engineering successful outcomes can sometimes be interpreted as manipulative. So you need to be careful as you use your frameworks to make sure that they're done in a respectful way, that they're done in a transparent way, and that it is um, moving everyone forward, that it's not simply you choosing to present one version of yourself to one person and um, another person gets a completely different version and you are not able to give a cohesive experience for your team. Like this is a framework that's going to help open communication. Words that you can use uh, across the entire team experience. Um, I think it does help to improve diverse thinking as well. My example on this, I, I'm a lousy brainstormer. So I, if I know I need to brainstorm a problem, then I can go and look for someone who has identified that they love to brainstorm and have them puzzle through a problem with me. I'm, I'm more of a do a lot of research and sit for a week or sit for a month and then suddenly the answer comes to me in the shower. But I'm not a doodler, I'm not, I can't muscle through, I can't force out the ideas in the way that someone who can whiteboard a problem can sort of work to a natural conclusion. So those different strategies are things that we can take advantage of. I know that I'm 
still, you know, I'm still developing my empathy muscle, shall we say. So if there's other people in my team who I know are better than me at it, then I can talk to them and work with them and help get them to help me um, work that muscle. It allows you to uncover motivators as well. So now that you know that I'm not, that I'm someone who consciously practices empathy in the workplace, when you watch me in a scenario, when you watch me in a situation, you may be able to see some of those behaviors and you may be able to spot where I'm using my preferences or where I'm working a little bit harder because I'm trying to practice something new. And as you work with your coworkers, your teammates, if you see that someone, they just seem to have no patience, absolutely never, you know, they always want to get to the end of the conversation, they just want the conclusion, they just want to move on, this is someone who's a fantastic decision maker. And allowing them to experience a brainstormer <laughs> in full on mode, you're gonna end up with conflict really quickly. So figuring out how to unpack those motivators and saying to someone, I know that you love brainstorming, but we're gonna, we're gonna make a decision now. And being able to sort of help people unpack their preferences can make for a smoother experience. Or in other words, think about what would so-and-so do in a scenario and then make or construct a scenario that's going to work for them. So I mentioned a few different, empathy being um, one of those uh, thinking strategies. So 18 thinking strategies, again, this is the 4DI system. Use True Colors or Myers-Briggs or any of the different systems that work for you. This one works for me. And we have on the far left the go or generate uh, thinking strategies, and I'll go into each of these in a little more depth. And then we have the um, slow down thinking strategies, which are to sort, to um, sort of relate to someone. They, they aren't generating new ideas, they're simply gathering and sorting, or sorry, sorting the information. And then finally we have the stop, and those are the, the people who are great at making decisions, they rely on their gut, they're not really sure why something, but they just happen to know it. So here we go here, this is the further breakdown. This is the actual 4DI, um, uh, three dimensions, seven mindsets, and 18 success strategies as they, systems do tend to love their language on things. So here we go with more specifically the uh, creative thinking. And here we have challenge, envision, brainstorm, reframe, uh, flash of insight, and flow. I love reframing problems. I'm great at the pivot. I'm great at taking what's my scenario here and moving a little bit in one direction or a little bit in another direction. In terms of the envision or the long-term visioning of something, I'm not great at thinking what something could be five years out. I don't know if any of you saw um, Dries' presentation in DrupalCon uh, Austin where he was looking at um, sort of the history of photography and uh, he was also talking about retail sales. But for me, there was a lot of far-reaching thinking of, of future, there's a term for this, what were the future thinkers? Does anyone know this word? Future forecasters, thank you. So that, that far away thinking, it's not something that I, I'm, I'm not a science fiction reader either, so for me that one's, that's a tricky one. But you may be going, oh, well that, but that's fun to think about the future, it's fun to think about science fiction. So those are different, things um, that fall into creative thinking. Phrasing wise, if you hear these phrases a lot from certain people, they may be a, a green or a creative thinker or have strong preferences for that. Can we try, I know we're done, but what about, uh, oh my goodness, I just had this great idea. So why do you think, and is this the best we can do? So all of those are sort of opening up that person who you thought you got to a conclusion and then they open another idea. They're probably, it's just where they feel most comfortable in terms of the preferred strategy. So now let's take a look at understanding or um, the yellow thinking in terms of slow down. And here we have scan, structure, clarify, tune in, empathize, and express. So half of these are dealing with information and half of them okay, not quite half, two-thirds, one-third and two-thirds, are dealing more with the human dimension of uh, information. And I tend, on any given day, if I am forced to make a decision in that binary question scenario, I feel much safer on the data side of things, the information side of things, than not 
gooey, fleshy, human side of things. And there are other people who will be the exact opposite. So for me, that's a skill that I need to practice. Um, I, random anecdote, almost applied to be a librarian, which may tell you something as well about how much I love to sort piles of information. Um, so my key phrases on this side, so what you're saying is that that clarification, that person who constantly, you just said something and then they're going to repeat exactly what you just said, that's me. Because I'm clarifying that I've understood what you've said. Just to clarify. Uh, so I think this is related to, so I've made this spreadsheet. Are there, is anyone in the room guilty of this one? Come on, project managers, I know you're out there. Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then that must feel horrible. So that's the person who has that empathy uh, preference. Finally, we have the decision makers or the stop thinking, the red thinking if we're going in traffic light colors. And at this point, we're breaking things down into um, value-driven decisions and critical decisions or critical, critical thinking decisions. So we have getting to the crux of the problem, validating a problem, uh, using your experience, concluding, gut instinct, and values driven. Some of the key phrases here, I'm ready to move on. So someone who is just always in that stop mode and they don't want to talk about things anymore. I don't know why I think this, but someone who um, uh, is going backwards in time in terms of their experience. Last time we tried this, the real problem is getting to the crux of the problem and my gut tells me. So again, someone who is using this language a fair amount probably is simply showing a preference for that decision-based thinking. So we can structure our meetings, we can structure our interactions in a way that says we're going to brainstorm for 20 minutes and then we're going to make a decision. And allowing those preferences to be identified or allowing those skills to be identified ahead of time means that someone who's participating in the experience can say, well, this is going to suck, but it's only going to suck for 20 minutes, and then I'm going to be able to make a decision. So how can you shape that experience so that people know what skills to bring to the table, and they know when they need to set their preferences aside uh, to use one of their other um, strategies? This is my breakdown from a couple of years ago more completely. Um, I'm trying to remember the year that I took this. I think it was, if not 2011, then 2012. So it's a couple of years ago now. I, I am a strong believer in, uh, for these systems, if you take them before and after coffee, you would probably not have the same answers on things. Uh, so I've, I certainly have no problem sharing this with you. Um, but it's not a complete snapshot of who I am today or who I would have been after coffee had I done this um, at a different time of day. So, so for me, some of the interesting things, um, the zeros in terms of the brainstorm and the envision, which I mentioned, the empathize, um, validate and crux as well, also quite low. And then the white scores over on the far right-hand side, those are sort of like your amplifier, so how likely you are to engage in any one of your thinking strategies. Um, and that's sort of a of volume as well, so am I strongly um, going to engage in one of these, or am I like, nah, I'm kind of kind of meh on things? Um, and those are a, a separate set of questions. Um, as you can see, the analytical thinking, the information ones, super high, because I have to have zeros somewhere else. I do also have those big peaks. So if you take that you don't need to do the test to start thinking about what are the things that you prefer to do, what are the things that you don't prefer to do, and, and do you want to practice some of the things that you would choose not to engage in. And finally, we get to the level three version of empathy. And this is where I, this is a really, really tricky one for me. Um, and the reason why is because I think when we start to engage at the level three, if, if you're not a trained um, anthropologist, if you're not a trained user researcher, and you can do your own training, you can be community trained, doesn't need to be formal training, but if you don't have that capacity to, um, to keep a, a personal distance, I think it becomes really easy to lose yourself in the problems that other people are describing. And you can, you, I shouldn't project, I have taken on more than what I was capable of dealing with uh, on some of these problems. And when I was 
I mean, we'll see in, in a second here, when I was arguing from the other person's position against myself, so it's kind of like playing devil's advocate, but when I was arguing from their position and thinking about, okay, why is this being brought to me the way it is? What does it like, what is it like for this person to experience the problem in this way? It turns out I was not a very nice person to deal with from that person's perspective. And I thought I was being fair and I thought I was being just and I thought everything was good, but it really made me question my own decisions. And if you're not prepared to question your own decisions and if you're not, if you don't have a support network to go along with this, this level of engagement can be, <coughs> it can be emotionally incredibly difficult. So, so do caution on this one. Don't just, don't just jump in and think you, can, uh, <laughs> think you can excel at it. But if we do go about it, and I've got a couple of good anecdotes I think for you, I think we can get truly creative problem solving at this level and um, you know, there are reasons why this discipline exists and why the, um, the outputs are so important for us I think as software developers. So here we go. The first one is to seek to understand. And this is um, sort of being the devil's advocate. Um, the assumption is that the listener is on the side of the complainer. So how do you put yourself into the complainer's shoes when you are the person who's being complained about? Um, so I, I'm not great phrasing on this. We'll skip ahead to some of my examples here. The next one is to seek to experience the problem. So my first um, anecdote, I was working in a distributed company last, a year ago actually, and my account manager, um, who was also sort of onboarding me as a project manager, broke her wrist. And uh, as a distributed team, we did a very large percentage of things uh, through type-based communication. So uh, Molly started using dictation software and it was um, new to her. It wasn't something that she had practiced. It wasn't something that she'd trained her voice on. And the results were phonetically correct, shall we say. Um, so if you read the dictated email, it absolutely made sense if you said the words out loud and could hear what you were saying instead of reading what, you, what the actual words were. And it was delightful most of the time, except when it wasn't, when it was really frustrating because you couldn't parse out what the dictation software was trying to do. And so what I did in this particular scenario is whenever I needed to get a, a written response back, I would structure the email in a way that she was able to respond with yes or no. It wasn't multiple questions that had multiple options in terms of, well, if I ask it this way, it's yes, but if I ask it that way, then it's no. One way to ask the question, a really clear and easy way for her to be able to give back that information to me, and it resulted in much faster communications, much clearer answers, and a much better way to actually have the project proceed. So that's one example of me thinking about what is this like to be in her shoes. And it wasn't until I'd actually spent time, as I um, went for a visit, it wasn't until I actually watched her using the dictation software and realized exactly how much frustration she was having with this software, how much swearing was involved in using this software, and just the drain of energy that it was causing, that I was like, you know, I can do something about this. It's not gonna take a lot of extra effort on my part to restructure the email. But it wasn't until I really watched the experience that I was able to put myself into her shoes. Before that, I, like, I mean, I kind of got that it was irritating, but I didn't, I didn't really understand how irritating it was. The next example that I have is, um, again, it's a lot of people being grumpy in my examples. Um, so the next example that I have, I was working with uh, a client who, he was a gem, like he was genuinely fantastic to work with. He was one of those clients who missed client 101 on how to be a not very nice client um, and, and was actually engaged. He came to our daily stand-ups. He was just wonderful to work with, absolutely loved him, except every two to four weeks he'd get really grumpy. And it was not clear to me why he was getting really grumpy. So I, the sort of second time that it happened, I was like, hey, you know, like, what, what's going on? Because everything was good and then things weren't so good. He's like, oh, I have to write another report. And you guys haven't really done anything that I can put in the report, but I know you're working really hard. I don't really know what to say. I was like, oh, well, why don't I just start giving you weekly summaries that you can copy and paste into your report? He's like, oh, that would be amazing. 
Well, we were already doing internal reporting. It wasn't that big of a deal to email him the information. But I didn't, I mean, I didn't know that he had to write reports. And as soon as I was able to start asking him questions about why, some, you know, why was he frustrated? Because I, we were doing great. I knew it had nothing to do with us. We were able to get richer information about the experience he was having and support that experience. So those are a couple of examples of how understanding someone else's position and being able to experience our world through their lens, a couple of easy changes on my side resulted in a much better experience for everyone. So that's the sort of empathy practitioner, even if you're not a user researcher, even if you're not an anthropologist, even if you're not. Um, I don't know, who else is in the room who feels that they are a professional empathy practitioner and what's your role? Shout out your, your job title or your role name. Silence, no one is an empathy practitioner. You're all here to learn, I love it. Okay, now there's, now there's a couple of hands, yep. Project leader, leader. yep. Yeah. My hearing is horrible, can you actually? People above, below, and beside. <laughs> people above, below, and on, on, on the sides, yes. <laughs> Excellent, and what other titles? Yep, Vicki. User experience to user researcher. Yeah, fantastic. Any other titles that people have where they feel like it's their job to be empathetic? Yes. Delivery manager and UX. I am, I am repeating as well for the recording, just for that benefit. Any other titles that folks have? Account management, yes. Yep. Team lead. What were the other ones? Okay, yeah, support and maintenance, yep. And service, service manager, yeah, yeah, excellent. So the, the thinking process um, ultimately should be not left to chance. We make it deliberate, we think about how we can actually engage with folks, and I think we can get much stronger outcomes. Um, and I know, like, I'm, I'm not running fast, um, but I know that we're going to have a lot of time, so I, I think... I, what I'm going to do is run through to the end, and then what we may do is um, clip off the recording and um, do an unrecorded Q&A, which is sometimes nicer for folks to be able to discuss issues that they're having without it being on the internet for the rest of infinity. Um, so we'll do that, uh, and if folks want to uh, stick around for it, that would be great. If you don't, that's okay too. So, uh, as I said, three basic levels in our how-to empathy uh, piece. The first level is to care just enough. And in that point, we're going to um, talk to people about their lives and then listen to whatever the experiences that they've had and later on refer back to that experience. Level two, use a framework. I'm happy to talk more about the framework that, that I know best. You may know other frameworks. There's definitely many out on the market. And then the third one is to engage with people um, from their perspective. And I think this is the one which is the most difficult to, it, it sounds straightforward, um, but I think often we end up providing sympathy, not empathy. So we're going to aim for, for uh, empathy, starting, you know, that first level really probably matches a bit better onto sympathy um, if you aren't able to just stop and listen to the story. The second one, getting understanding, and then the third one really maps on to true empathy. A, um, another quote from the late Maya Angelou, I think we all have empathy, we may not have the courage to display it. And again, it's a muscle, it has to be practiced, it's a skill, it has to be practiced and developed. You can choose to use it, you can choose not to use it. But I don't think it's something that is um, without value, and I think that there is more and more in the tech community which places value on empathy than when I first started two decades ago, <laughs> it's actually been, hmm. anyways. So, um, but I, it's nice that we are starting to recognize it as a skill that needs to be practiced um, and not just something that gets lip service. So that, as I mentioned, slides are up. Um, I'm gonna remind everyone about the sprints really quickly because we've been asked to do that. You should definitely come on Friday. Even as a non-technical person, one of the hugely valuable things that we can get 
is a reading of all of the comments and then rewriting the description of what the problem currently is. So if you've got some fairly basic analytical skills in terms of being able to decipher a conversation and then present back a summary of the conversation, hugely valuable. If you are technical as well, fantastic, we can get you set up. Um, but that's happening on Friday. So again, uh, my slides are already up. There's a recording there as well. Um, and what I'm gonna do at this point, if there's um, questions that you think are relevant to a wider audience, there's a mic over in the corner, which means that I don't have to uh, repeat your question. If there are none, then what I'm gonna do is I'll step away from the mics that were not recorded for the next bit. All right, fantastic. Thank you very much, everyone. End of the recording, la la la.